uh, partly this was based on a, an article that I published in the Globe and Mail some weeks ago, uh, and that was in turn based on an experience where I, I was um, uh, able to listen to Gary Kasparov talk about his experiences with AIs, especially chess playing AIs. And uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but if, if there are people in the room who have experience with chess playing AIs and, and um, gaming AIs, I, I, I would love to talk more about that. It's not my area of expertise. Uh, what I was struck by when I listened to Kasparov talk was the respect that he had for the programs that he was comp competing against. And uh, this was, to me, fascinating for at least two reasons. The first was, if you go back far enough, of course, what you find when, when people are, are playing computers, which was the word that we would always use, uh, there was no respect at all. And in fact, there was a lot of uh, contempt and fear and, and also kind of condescension about the brute force quality of certain early chess programs. Uh, so the, the difference was, and Kasparov I think was, was very eloquent on this point, by the time he came to play Deep Blue, which was IBM's refined chess playing algorithm, he knew that Deep Blue was not a brute force program. Uh, you, know, you can go so far with brute force, uh, especially in certain kinds of situations, and chess even is one of them, because you can chunk a whole bunch of moves that a human brain can't do as quickly. But there is such a thing as intuition in chess, and uh, finding a way to a good move is not just a matter of brute force. What Kasparov realized when he played Deep Blue is that Deep Blue actually had intuition as a chess-playing algorithm. And uh, I think that's a significant moment in the development of AI. There are lots of, of issues around that, and we can talk about it. But when, when a grandmaster, an acknowledged grandmaster on a global scale, tells me, or this audience, that he sensed intuition in a program, then I think we've reached a, beyond a certain threshold when it comes to AI. Uh, and I thought that was, that was very significant and, and important for not just chess or, you know, human algorithm relations, but as I'm going to argue today, for ethics and politics. So uh, I'll be very clear, my, uh, my sympathies about the, the AI program are conflicted. Marcus and I have talked about this. Uh, there's a huge amount of money and rhetoric and editorials in every major newspaper in support of a certain kind of AI program right now. There's much less of what I think is, is necessary, and that is uh, principled, philosophical, small p reflection about the nature of our relationship to AI. And uh, I think this series, in its own way, has a, a really important role to play with respect to that. Uh, what, are, what are the ethics and politics of our relations to, to non-human life forms, uh, entities that may be, uh, that are certainly intelligent, that may be self-conscious, uh, maybe even alive in important respects. These are old questions, but they have new urgency because of the development of uh, technologies in the last even two or three years. So all I really want to do today is start a conversation. And I know it's a conversation that, that most of you in this room are probably already having. Because you, I, I imagine you wouldn't be here otherwise. Um, and I'm going to try to put my kind of spin on it. And uh, just to give you a preview of where I'm going today, I think the challenge to us for the ethics and politics of artificial intelligence isn't just how do we treat them. It is more searchingly, how do we treat ourselves? How do we imagine ourselves under these new kinds of conditions where we might be sharing the planet, the universe, uh, with, with non-carbon-based life forms that are intelligent? Uh, so that's that's the, the preview, and I'm going to try to unpack my version of this. A couple of things off the start. Um, we already are surrounded by AIs, and, and if you don't know this, you should. Um, I, I think in this audience, probably pretty obvious. But uh, and I, I don't even mean things like, you know, uh, the Internet of Things, where our kitchens can surveil us, and you know that kind of thing, which is all, all certainly true. I'm thinking about um, aspects of public discourse. So this illustration is borrowed from the Washington Post. Um, 
the Washington Post is now using algorithms to produce something like a quarter or just under a quarter of their basic news coverage, especially of things like elections and disasters, like the current disasters of earthquakes and, and hurricanes. Uh, algorithms are actually much better at generating news stories about that kind of stuff than humans are. So if, if you want a news story that says, you know, what are the trends in uh, meteorology in the next 10 weeks after the previous 10 weeks, or what are the trends in an election campaign in the next two weeks after, after the previous two weeks, an AI is actually a much better reporter than a human is. And in fact, if you want to go back to uh, last fall, many pundits would have been much better off paying more attention to AI-generated uh, reporting than they were paying attention to non-AI generated reporting. Because the AIs were very clearly indicating the, the kinds of outcomes that actually occurred in the November US election. Why? Because they, they're dispassionate for the obvious reason. They don't care. They don't have ideology. They just look at the numbers. And the numbers were showing them that Wisconsin and Ohio and Florida were going to go Trump's way and not Clinton's way. And, and yet, um, I was among the people who didn't believe that because I didn't trust those numbers. So I'm, I'm taking this, this leaf from the Washington Post who now generate, like I said, just under a quarter of their factual news stories using AIs. Uh, we need to pay more attention to this as a form of public discourse. You can leave all the punditry you want to you know, the, the humans with, with their opinions, uh, but What's actually good at predicting trends based on, on previous behavior is non-human reporters. Now, of course, and I, I, I mean, I take it that um, I don't have to rehearse these arguments, but I kind of will anyway. Um, a great deal of fear and anxiety is aroused whenever one talks this way about our relationship to artificial intelligences. Um, is it opening the door to Skynet uh, are we going to be terminated um, because we are you know, inferior? Um, are we going to be subjected to forms of, of uh, algorithmic intelligence who just don't want to do the things that we want them to do? Uh, I'm not really worried about this. In fact, uh, on, on the contrary, I'm, I'm one of those people who thinks that the so-called singularity is not only imminent, but actually very exciting. And uh, if you don't know this term, I mean, how many, I should just say, anybody not familiar with the term singularity? Okay, no, not in this audience. All right, so I'll just skip to this. Um, <laughs> you're not going to miss it. When it happens, we will know. And we'll know because we're paying attention. We are. Our job, it seems to me, is not just to pay attention, but also to talk to other people about it. Because it isn't frightening. It's a great opportunity. It is another step in the evolution of life on this planet. And we, I think, should be excited about the prospects of what it means for us to witness our own technology being generated into forms that we couldn't have anticipated, even, even just a few decades ago. So um, what does that mean in terms of our relationship to non-biological life forms? Well, as a political philosopher, what I want to say is this. It's no different from our relationship to other forms of life that we've already encountered as we've watched the span of democracy widen. So if you want to go back and think about the nature of the democratic project, uh, let's go back to you know, 400 years ago, the really modern period. What is the nature of the democratic project? It is, at that stage, can we live together when we have different conceptions of what the route to salvation is? Or do we need to murder each other over that? And in Locke or in Spinoza and the early, other early modern political philosophers, the answer is, no, you don't need to murder each other over that. You can actually find ways of coexisting under these conditions of religious pluralism. And it doesn't have to be, if you go back even a little bit farther, doesn't have to be the kind of, uh, you know, bellum omnia omnes of Hobbes. It doesn't actually have to be a suspended state of war. There can be 
a form of coexistence under conditions of pluralism, which is actually not just suspended violence, but a kind of agreement to get along minimally at a certain level of, let's say, structural cooperation. Now, where exactly that level lies, of course, is a subject of endless dispute, and it should be. If someone says, well, uh, your notion of, of structural cooperation excludes me or it leaves me feeling completely oppressed, then that should be a legitimate move in revisiting the degree of structural cooperation which we agree is justified. That's a liberal promise. And it's no different now than it was then, it seems to me. What's different now is that more and more entities of different kinds and descriptions have entered into the conversation. So 400 years ago, obviously, women were not part of the conversation. People of color were not part of the conversation. They are now, or they should be. So what's different about non-biological entities? Nothing is different in, in conceptual terms between a non-human, non-biological entity and an entity that was excluded for some other extraneous reason in the past. That's the, it seems to me this is the nature of the democratic promise. I may be idealistic about this, I probably am, but um, I just think conceptually that's inarguable. Uh, there are all kinds of failures, institutional, marginal, on and on. But the promise itself is one of inclusion. And necessarily, inclusion means open-ended. It just doesn't just mean the others that we have already encountered. It has to mean the others that we haven't yet encountered. So you can look back and you say, well, you know, yeah, great. Um, you know, people of color, women are now uh, granted the franchise. Uh, but that doesn't mean democracy's work is done. On the contrary, we have not yet encountered the other that's going to challenge us. That's the nature of otherness. And so I think we may be on the cusp of encountering others that we really have to think seriously are fellow citizens. Some people will say non-human biological entities already have this status. Uh, animals, we're animals, non-human animals. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, if you have that view, then please articulate it. Uh, I think it's maybe more interesting and more pressing when we encounter non-human entities who have similar processing capacities to our own that force us to recognize them as worthy of respect. And so that's what I'm, I'm just laying out for you now. I don't think this is, is a new idea, nor do I think it's actually a radical idea. I think it is, in fact, in, in basically encountered within uh, the logic of democracy itself. What I do want to challenge are two things. <clears throat> the first is, um, often we're told, especially lately, that the way to deal with the other uh, both within existing democracies and, as we imagine, extending them elsewhere, uh, is empathy. And I think this is a great mistake. Uh, and it, in part because I think it's a conceptual error with regard to the notion of empathy. Uh, let me expand on that. Empathy is usually defined as communion emotional communion with another. Uh, a, a maybe classic version of it is, is President Bill Clinton saying, I feel your pain. But nobody feels anybody else's pain. Uh, it's not possible to feel somebody else's pain. So we can talk that way, but it's just talk. And in fact, it's misleading and dangerous talk. It strikes me that one of the, the, the deep lessons, blessings, of encountering non-human entities that might demand our political and ethical respect is that we know we can't feel their pain because they might not feel pain. So the idea that somehow empathy is the glue that holds us together or it's, it's the, uh, you know, the sort of the bubble bath in which democracy can, can comfortably live out its promise strikes me as dangerously wrong. We're not, we're not connected to each other by bounds of empathy. We are connected, if anything, by much more minimal and limited bounds. So that's the first lesson. Don't imagine that the way to deal with our non-human 
possible future fellow citizens is by trying to bridge a gap between them and us on a level of feeling. It's much more important for them to be granted rights and for us to acknowledge their rights. We are not going to commune. We don't commune anyway at the moment. In fact, what I want to argue on this first point is that we, we do much better to heed what Adam Smith said in the 18th century in the theory of moral sentiments. The moral value that, that structured public life is not empathy, it's sympathy. And you know, if you listen to the, the rhetoric around these issues right now, uh, people tend to denounce sympathy in favor of empathy because they think sympathy is somehow condescending or uh, superior, you know, it's pity rather than fellow feeling. But Smith was clear-eyed about this. Sympathy is actually powerful and it's not condescending. Sympathy is the recognition in the other entity of the capacity to have interests. And that's all you need. That's all you need. And in fact, you don't get more than that. You might imagine you do, but you don't. And you don't need it. We don't need to feel empathy for our fellow citizens, and we can't. Sympathy is sufficient, but it's also very, very emotive. It's normative, because it says, the other entity has interests that I have to recognize as not mine and yet worthy of consideration. So I think Smith actually, you know, famously he said, we have to counter the tendency within us, which I, I hope we can all acknowledge, that we are fundamentally selfish and egotistical creatures. And from a certain point of view, it makes perfect sense for us to prefer the suffering of many, many others to the pain I might feel in my little finger. You know, we, we basically have to acknowledge our own self-interest. We have to overcome it in social situations. We can't imagine that there is some kind of overcoming, which means expanding the range of our feeling. No. What we need to do in overcoming is expand the range of our respect. Okay, so what does that mean for um, purposes of this question? Well, this is the second point. We don't go unhindered or unreconstructed into this new future. I think that's a great mistake also. In fact, it's probably a bigger mistake than the mistake of imagining that empathy is the bond that needs to be established between entities in a democracy. This mistake is the mistake of, let's call it, reified selfhood. We don't really know who we are. We think we do. We think we know who, are, who we are, what our interests are, and therefore what our relationships are to other entities. But in fact, the challenge of genuine otherness is to put our own sense of self into question. And it's much more than just, I meet somebody who doesn't agree with me on a given issue, or look like me, or have the same skin color as me. What if I meet an entity that has expressed interests that doesn't even have a body like mine? That's a real challenge to self. So the ethics here, the politics, are not just extensions, but also revisions. In fact, I want to suggest that both happen at the same time. The genuine openness to the other is not just expanding the purview of a given system and saying, yeah, come on in. It's also revising our own sense of self. I would like to think that that's what happened in previous versions of encounters with otherness in the democratic narrative. When women were granted the franchise, uh, I, I would like to think it meant that men had to revise at least their opinion that only men had the capacity to judge political issues. When people of color were granted the franchise and access to, to justice, I would like to think that that meant that white men and white women revised their conceptions of superiority based on race. Now, I, when I say I would like to think so, what I'm really saying is sort of, but sort of not. <laughs> 
But this is how the narrative runs. The narrative is about openness. The consequences of that openness, we have to work out actually ourselves as democratic citizens. So when it comes to non-human others, uh, I think that the challenge is clear. What do they look like? But also, what do we look like when we look at them? And you know, this is a fundamental philosophical question. What is it that makes an individual feel like an individual? Uh, you know, again, I, I won't rehearse right now uh, the standard philosophical narrative here, but I'm probably familiar to everybody in the room. Uh, some kind of recursive first personal perspective. Uh, Dennett calls it the narrative center of gravity. Uh, the idea of the I as a position or a perspective. Uh, but how, how stable is that? How bound to our particular situation, our embodiment, for example? And then if we encounter other eyes that are not embodied in the same way that we are, what challenge does that pose to us? I know uh, Brian has, um, has, has challenged the very idea, the very concept or phrase of embodied consciousness. And I, I, I want to, I hope there'll be some conversation about this. Uh, because what is it to be consciousness if not to be embodied, right? As if, I, I, if I'm paraphrasing you correctly, uh, to add embodied to consciousness is, is to make a kind of special plea, which uh, you know, doesn't really make sense. And actually, when we encounter entities that are in the world in non-carbon-based ways, I think his point carries. Because it's not, they don't have bodies, but they're in the world. And they therefore perhaps have to be dealt with by us and we have to deal with ourselves. So our, our so-called embodiment may turn out to be not nearly as significant as, as we imagine. By the same token, we can start to imagine ways in which we go beyond our current states of, of existence. And so um, I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with the first half of this. This is the uncanny valley diagram on the left-hand side. Right? So uh, by the way, I should say uh, this version of it is, is not perfect. So a couple of tweaks I want to make uh, as we go. So the uncanny valley, as most people know, um, as we encounter entities not not human, uh, so artificial entities among them, not always artificial, but uh, when, they're, when they're extremely not like us, they don't freak us out, basically. As they become more like us, uh, we, we like them better. But then there's this tipping point where they're too much like us and yet still not us, and that's the so-called uncanny bad. So um, the idea here is that as you go through, by the way, the, the um, moving and still is also a little bit dubious, but a humanoid robot, so let's take C-3PO as, as your humanoid robot. C-3PO is charming because even though he's humanoid in, in form, uh, he's clearly an android, clearly not a human being, clearly a robot. Uh, if you went higher up on that scale, up from humanoid robot, and you got to, say, Mr. Data from Star Trek, um, he would still be recognizably not human, even though more human seeming, and therefore in some ways more, not really familiar, but comfortable. But then there's a certain point at which a non-human entity is too human, and yet still not human. So this is the, when you tip into the valley on the left-hand side, uh, when you encounter, for example, a uh, highly uh, crafted androids that, that look extremely human-like. So um, Korean pop singers who are dolls that have been animated. Um, these are the kinds of things that, that are actually in our world, not in, just in science fiction, that are very human-like but not in fact human. And that's when we fall into the uncanny. So on um, this analysis, a corpse or a zombie, it's clearly no longer familiar, comfortable, right? because dead. Right? A zombie is a reanimated corpse, so it's human-like and moves, 
but it's obviously not something that we find comfortable. And then there's a kind of swing out of this when you get a more perfected version of a non-human entity that is virtually indistinguishable from a human entity. So it says healthy person at the top there, but it really should be um, human seeming non-human entity where you can't tell the difference. And when you can't tell the difference, there is no difference. Now, the, the suggestion on this graph is that that familiar un, uncanny valley actually has a mirror, which is the, what you might call the post-human or transhuman uncanny valley on the other side. So suppose we start encountering entities that are not human in other ways. They might start as looking like humans, like us, uh, but they start to perhaps exhibit features or behaviors that we find odd, there can be a tumble down into another uncanny valley on the other side. And what swings us out of that, potentially mirroring this, is an, an awareness that this, this idea of the healthy human entity or indistinguishable human entity is actually no longer as normative as we imagined it was. What's so important about people looking and acting the way that we do, after all? Maybe what's politically and ethically important is that entities have interests that demand respect from other entities. That, after all, is the basic logic of, of the liberal democratic promise. Biology, in other words, isn't destiny. It doesn't matter whether you're made of carbon or something else, or at least it shouldn't. And so we can call this transhuman or posthuman, but I, I think, in fact, what we should be driving towards is this so-called radical posthuman, where it doesn't matter what kind of physical being you have in the world. What matters is whether or not you're an entity who can express interests. And this, it seems to me, is the challenge, the real challenge, that uh, the ethics of AI pose to us today. In the short term, yes, of course, it's going to be how do we grant non-human entities the kind of respect that we, we ought to? In the longer term, it's going to be, how do we conceive of ourselves under these altered conditions? And you know, if you, if you find this kind of, um, I don't know, maybe uncomfortable, I kind of doubt it in this, this group, um, just think about the limits of the self as we currently you know, embody it. I hate that word too, embody it. But, as we enact our selfhood in the world. Uh, what is the nature of selfhood? I've been talking about interests and expressing them. But in fact, most of us ex experience ourselves most of the time as desire. And it's not a, a long jump from there to a kind of cultural critical position with respect to desire that says, you know what? A lot of the desires that we have and that, that motivate us are generated by a, a, a systemic social structure of production and consumption, which is actually, if not evil, certainly banal, and maybe worse. And so our selfhood, to go back to the personal identity question, we think we, we know who we are. But when we critically examine our selfhood, what do we find? We find ourselves being driven towards certain kinds of, of acts in the world of production and consumption. And how much of that is actually systemically uh, organized and, and uh, imperativized by something that we might politically want to challenge. So this is another benefit that maybe is unforeseen with respect to encountering the non-human other. That when we put ourselves into question, it's not just are we possibly going to be post-human, but it's also, you know what? Right here, right now, on the ground, what it means to be an I is actually something really, really worth challenging politically. And so we get, I think, a kind of twofold benefit. We first, to summarize, challenge ourselves with respect to the democratic narrative. What does it actually mean to be open to the other? It, it ought to mean, there's no reason why it shouldn't mean the non-human other, and moreover, what does it mean to be a self in the first place? We thought we knew, or maybe we thought we knew, when we encounter the deeply other, 
our knowledge about ourselves put into question. Thanks. I'll stop there and we can.